We knew that enemy was going to press in hard, didn't we? We wondered if he might show up or just not appear at all. Glad to be with all of you tonight as we continue to think about winning the war within. I thought we'd start with a man, a hero of the screen, Barney Fife. You know the plot of that old Andy Griffith series was always the same. There would be a crisis, Barney would show up completely under control. Overconfident, self-secure. Do you remember him saying, my body is a weapon? And whatever was before him, he was ready. And then what happened? He fell again and again and again. And we all laughed. And then we took in next week. Why? Because there he would be. There would be the problem. Andy Griffith would have a handle on what was really going on and how we needed to assess and address the crisis, but Barney Five ready to get in there and blow it one more time. And one of our brothers here saw this picture when you were at the barber shop over the weekend and you texted it to me and said, man up. And I thought, that's exactly the reason we have man up in God's girls. And that's why we meet on a Sunday night. And that's why we're in the word of God. Because as we draw close to him, we realize that we are not the weapon. He is. And he can give us the courage and the tools and the skills we need in order to battle against temptation, defeating habits, and sin. You'll be opening to Luke 4. We'll see several myths tonight. We'll explore other aspects from the Word of God as well. The things we assume, that we take for granted, that we think are true and real about this spiritual warfare, and yet we might be quite mistaken. And some of these will have a ring of truth, a, a germ, an element that is right. But we might base our decisions on an addition to these ideas that really is not found in the Bible. Here's what we've done so far. We've talked about the nature and the cause and the base of this conflict that we all experience, right? It never seems to go away. The schemer out to get us and what he might do to trip us up. The governor who limits and oversees and provides the way of escape, God himself. The pivot, the position of prayer, the predictability that before things happen, they're about to happen. And so we're to make no provision. We're to think ahead so we don't put ourselves in such a position. The sword, the word of God, the support last time, accountability, confess your sins to one another, pray for each other that you may be healed. Love, serve, bear one another's burdens. And now the myths, the assumptions that we might bring to the table, bring on the battlefield when we engage the enemy and then, uh-oh, we took something for granted that turned out not to be accurate after all. Let's notice several of these. First, it's a myth that we are forced into temptation by the choices and actions of others. I don't read a lot of fiction. I don't often recommend a book, but I've been enjoying The Traveler's Gift by Andy Andrews. Do you know this book? It's about a man named David Ponder. In his mid-40s, he has a wife and daughter, and all of a sudden, after working hard to support his company, it's taken over. He loses his job his company car, his income. His wife has become a homemaker to care for their 12-year-old girl. And everything comes crashing in on David Ponder. And in despair, he gets in his car and he drives faster and faster, up to 90 miles per hour, which I do not recommend. And it looks like he's going to drive over a cliff, but instead he goes into this time travel and he visits seven figures of history. And each one gives him a gift, a key, a tip to help him face his life. And I've considered three of these so far. I can't wait to finish the book. But I have to talk about it for a moment tonight. Because the first one, he finds himself in Potsdam, Germany, a suburb of Berlin, Tuesday, July 24th, 1945. And the room is warm and Ponder's looking around. He's trying to figure out who this man is. And he wonders if... He himself has died and he's sick. This couldn't be his doctor. And one thing comes to another and he realizes as he turns his wheels that this is the time when world powers are coming together to decide what to do about Japan. 
And the man in whose office Ponder finds himself is President Harry Truman. And he must choose whether to drop the bomb or not. And his message to David Ponder is, you are where you are, you're in the situation you're in because of your options. Because of opportunities you had, and that you took this one instead of another one. And Ponder says, no, no, they closed my company, they took my car, I don't have my income anymore. And Truman says, well, you chose to go to the school you did, to major in that subject, to take that position, to become connected with that company, to marry the woman you did, and then you had your daughter, you bought your house, you relied on that car. And while there are things that were out of your control, it's your response to those things. That's what puts you where you are. And Truman said, here I am with a choice of the next step to take. He said, how could I face the future if so many American lives were lost and we had something in our arsenal <coughs> that could have ended the war swiftly and decisively? <coughs> and so, of course, as you know, the bomb was dropped. The war ended because Truman accepted his role and his spot Instead of blaming Japan and Germany and Stalin and Russia and all the people and all the forces and all the things around him, if he'd done that, he would have taken no action. And who knows what the outcome might have been. And so his message to David Ponder is, the buck, the buck stops here. So Ponder decides, from now on, I'll accept responsibility for my past. The beginning of wisdom is to take charge of my own problems and free myself into a bigger, brighter future that I will choose. Never again will I blame my parents, my spouse, my boss, or other employees for my present situation. Education, lack of one, genetics, circumstantial ebb and flow of everyday life. I am where I am today, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially because of decisions I have made. My decisions have always been governed by my thinking. So today I will change where I am by changing the way I think. My thoughts will be constructive, not destructive. My mind will live in the solutions of the future, not dwell on the problems of the past. I seek the association of those who are working and striving to bring about positive changes in the world. I will never seek comfort by associating with those who have decided just to be comfortable. I understand that God did not put in me the ability always to make right decisions. He did, however, give me the ability to make a decision and then make it right. The rise and fall of my emotional tide will not deter me from my course. When I make a decision, I'll stand behind it. My energy will go into it. I will waste none on second thoughts. My life will not be an apology. It will be a statement. <coughs> that illustrates this first myth that we also find noted at the very beginning in Genesis when the man said to God, it's the woman that you gave me. She handed me the fruit and I took it. The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. And you know the old line, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. No one, to hurt, nothing to point with, right? But we had no fingers to point at anybody. Or then Exodus 32 and 33. You remember when Moses was delayed up at Mount Sinai? The people pushed and pushed and pushed on Aaron. We need some God we can look at and touch and worship. Give me your gold. And he puts it in the oven and fashions a calf. And then when his brother confronts him. He says, well, we, they made me do it. And, 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 and out came this calf. You remember that. In 1 Samuel 15, when Samuel comes to Saul, and Saul has taken on himself presumptuously a task that God did not give him. And that was to offer the sacrifice. He was to wait until the appointed one Samuel arrived, but the people were starting to scatter, and Saul felt the 
departure and he felt the burden and he felt the uncertainty and the risk of it. And so he tells Samuel, I pushed myself because in effect the people made me do it. My Bible is open now to 1 Samuel 15. Finally, Saul says, verse 24, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, therefore, pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said, you have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Saul recognized that he had adopted a myth, a fable, an untruth, that he was cornered, he was forced, he had no option. I had to do it. And by the time he came around and said, this is what I chose, it was too late. He could be forgiven, but the consequences of his behavior would cost him the throne of Israel, and God would choose a man after his own heart. Turn to James chapter 1. We'll look at a few things there. You know, verse 2 begins by saying, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials and testing. Because that's what produces patience and maturity and helps you to be complete, lacking nothing. And if you're lacking wisdom, ask God. He'll give to you without holding back, without reproach, without looking for a reason to deny you. And then verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he will receive the crown of life. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'll be tempted by God. Each one is tempted when he's carried away by his own desires. He's enticed. And he takes hold as a fish would a worm. And as a result becomes as long as we look for something outside of ourselves and we make ourselves the victims of the actions and responsibilities and decisions of other people, we'll never win the war within. Is that right? So we're going to step up. We're going to man up. And we're going to say who I am and what I do, I choose to do. And it's not the wishes of others, though they may seek to influence me, we must be quick to say, the serpent did influence Eve, but it was her decision. She did offer the fruit to her husband, but it was his choice. We can't say the devil made me do it. We can't say, oh, it's the wife, it's the husband, it's the parents, it's the boss, it's the circumstances. When we sin, it's because we chose to sin. No one can make us hate. No one can make us lose our temper. No one can make us curse or retaliate or displease God in any way. That is a myth. The second one is related to it. You might look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Oh, I'm just walking along and <laughs> unintentionally, unexpectedly, accidentally, this uh, Ooh, this hole just materialized and I dropped into it. I'm just walking up and I, and I, I fell into temptation. The Bible uses that phrase. We saw it this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Warning that those who love money fall into temptation into a snare and a trap and bring on themselves many pains or pains that can destroy them. So you say, wait a minute, Corey, doesn't the Bible say that we can fall into the... Yes. But the person that falls into temptation doesn't do so accidentally or unintentionally. He first loves money. He's after things, material wealth, more stuff. And that is their reason why he falls into temptation. A third myth. Now we're in Luke 4. The fact that I'm tempted, that must mean I've sinned. Oh no, I thought something. I desired. 
this or that. The idea entered my mind. I, I was interested. I must not be right with God. I'm unfaithful. I'm not walking in the light. I'm lost as a person ever could be. Otherwise, I wouldn't be tempted. If I were just mature, if I were just serious, if I had just prayed more and studied more and done more, I wouldn't have this interest, this wish, this appetite or idea. How do we know that's false? Because in Luke chapter 4, after he fasted for 40 days and nights, Jesus became hungry. And physically, he was craving food. He was starving for it. And the devil suggests that he turn the stones into bread. Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. There are those that say, because Jesus was God in the flesh, it's only a description. It's not really accurate because he couldn't have wanted that food. But he did. You see, wanting it is not the same as taking it. Someone said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head. You know the rest of it. You can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. In other words, if you see something, you want something, there's this instant, almost automatic desire. What do you do next? And it may not just be some desire. It could be anger. It could be pride. It could be the instant thought, I'm going to lie and get out of this. But I don't lie. I catch myself. And I refuse it. Because of that, I have not sinned. God does not tempt us. We notice in James 1. But he does test us. Genesis 22. Abram, take your son Isaac to the mountain I will show you, Moriah. And offer him up to me there. Genesis 22.1 says he tested that patriarch. Deuteronomy 8, he tested the people of Israel, letting them go without food in the wilderness to see if they would understand that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But God does not tempt, that is, entice, allure, set up a trap in order to make us stumble. God puts us through our paces to equip us to build muscle and resilience and courage and foresight and experience so that we'll be able to win the battle within. The tempter wants us to fail. The Father wants us to pass. And that is one key difference between tempting Tested. It's a little bit complicated because the Greek word translated test is the same word that translated tempt or try. I'm glad we sang tempted and try. Thank you, Ted, for all the songs you've led tonight. We used to sing tempted and tried at the beginning of our Greek class. <laughs> And we would do so in a woeful sad. And we tried to do it when Dr. Floyd would come in. So he would sympathize. He never did. Yeah, you know, and there we would go. Farther along, we'll understand all about it. You know, as if we could somehow grasp the language down the road. But in James 1, verse 2, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. Verse 12, blessed is the man that perseveres when he's tested. And then 13 and following, let no one say when he's tempted. Those three words, to try, to test, and tempt, they all translate the same Greek word. And so the translators use the context and their best judgment as to how to render it. God does not want us to fall. He wants us to soar. The devil, on the other hand, would like to take us 
down. But the fact that we're tempted does not mean that we've sinned or that we've displeased God. Here's another myth. That after we battle temptation, we necessarily are weak and weary and worn. Oh, we may be, depending on how the conflict goes, but in Luke chapter 4, it was after Jesus' temptations in the wilderness that he began his ministry. Confidently, courageously, expectantly, in the power of the Spirit of God. You see, we battle temptation, and depending on the outcome, we're more resilient. We're more steady. We stand taller. We see farther. We're better prepared for the next one. James 1, we noted, the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its completed work that the man of God may be complete. In Romans chapter 5, if you turn there, there are three reasons the Christian exalts or rejoices. One is we rejoice in hope and glory of God. That's the future. Down around verses 10 and 11, we rejoice because we've been reconciled to God through the death of His Son. That's the past. In between, we exalt or celebrate our emotions. Why? Well, the reason is parallel to that in James 1, because this is the way God molds us and makes us to be godly and strong and mature. Romans 5, 3. Not only this, we exult in our tribulations or troubles. Why? That brings perseverance, proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. How does God build our hope? Through these skirmishes. Through these back and forth tug of war encounters with sin. Another myth, perhaps we touched on this, if I'm really mature, I won't be tempted anymore. Once I've said no to that sin, I'm done with it. And sometimes Christians develop this idea, and as a result, we set ourselves up for another fall. If you look at Luke 4 again, only that gospel tells us that after Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, the enemy left him until a more opportune time. Not permanently. It suggested that when Simon Peter told Jesus in Matthew 16, You won't have to go to the cross. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. That this was Peter, of course expressing that which Satan was trying to express in those three temptations. Or that in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see again the back and forth agony of the Savior as he still must choose afresh to do the will of God. Are my temptations different from yours? In a sense, yes. In your life, your house, your job, your family, your friends? No, what you go through is not absolutely identical to anyone else. But that the heart of temptation is 1 John 2, 15 to 17. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Everything that tempts you or me fits in one of those three categories. And they've been compared to the three temptations we noted in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 that the devil brought to Jesus. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so Hebrews 4.15 can say, Jesus was tempted in all points like we are. Was it Mary? Wasn't the father of children? Didn't he 
deal with the temptations of the internet and social media and a host of other things. But when you think about what temptation is, an enticement to disobey God, at the root of it, 1 Corinthians 10 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what? What is common to man. The devil wants to isolate you and make you think that you're the only person facing what you're facing and that if the brothers and sisters knew it, they would think less of you. And so when the opportunity comes to confess sin and to ask for prayers and strength and renewal and restoration, that song, Renew My Courage, Lord, it needs renewed. Restore the fire. You may hesitate because nobody else would understand. The fact is, everybody else would understand and identify with. Several times the Bible tells us to flee. 1 Corinthians 6. Flee sexual immorality. 1 Timothy 6.11 talking about, again, the love of money. You, man of God, flee these things. And 2 Timothy 2.22 flee youthful lusts. And often in these passages, the Spirit of God will tell us in the Word to pursue this instead. In other words, flee from sin and chase after righteousness, holiness, godliness, peace, for example. The point here is that if I physically remove myself from this place or that place, but there's not a change that takes place in here, I'm going to keep running and running and running physically and never deal with the heart of the problem. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Temptation is here. So what I run away from is that occasion, that place, that time, that opportunity. I run away from that, and that's good. I should run. The Bible tells me to. But it also says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that God can renew my and Colossians 3, that I can think of things above and not earthly things. God will help me to keep putting to death those sinful ways and defeating habits. So yes, I'm going to run physically. But I'm also going to recognize physically running does not protect me necessarily from the same difficulty again. And then finally, We present this series because it touches all of us. There's not one in the room who has gotten past the war. Not one who can say, I finished it, it's over, victory is mine, I'll never be tempted again. There was a Protestant reformer named John Wesley who taught perfectionism and he actually presented the idea that such a state was possible in this life. But 1 John chapter 1 says, we say we do not sin or we do not sin. We make him a liar. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So God promises perfection in the life to come. And meanwhile, we're on the journey, and that process is called sanctification, but it's a process. Does that mean this will never be over? Thankfully, in heaven, Revelation 21 talks about all the things that will not be there. No mourning, no death, no night, no pain. And then it says all the former things are passed away. And verse 8, that everything evil will be cast out of it. Won't it be grand not to be tempted? Won't it be a joy not to face another struggle, another day, another spot where I'm interested in that. Should I? No, no, no. And I fight, and I fight, and I fight. Romans 7 describes that. 
that there's a tug of war wanting to do what's right and yet also being attracted sometimes, thinking about, being tempted to say or do that which is evil in the sight of God. There's an old song that says, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. I'm going home to live with God. And one of the reasons that you and I yearn for heaven, one of the reasons we believe that to live is Christ and to die is gain is because then we'll be done with the troubles of the world. We'll go home to live with God. And then the victory will be ours. The war will be over. And we will celebrate forever the one who made it all possible. So we face the myths. We bring God's truth to bear. And we lean on the word of God, the spirit of God. Taking day by day in that process that leads to heaven. You can't win this war without the spirit of God. Without the Lordship of Jesus Christ, without the rock foundation of the Word, you and I admit that when we're baptized in Christ. We're seeking solid ground. We want the whole armor because we don't have it. And when we rise to begin our new life as His children, He gives us what we need to face this battle every day. If you'd seek prayers or encouragement, we can help you in any way. Opportunity is yours to respond as we stand together.